Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a great dinner yesterday night. We start the morning session, and I give the microphone to our chair, Anton Rebhan. Hey, welcome back. Um, please take your seats. And it's my pleasure to announce Umut Gürsel from Utrecht to tell us about gauge gravity duality in the re review talk. I assume about 20 Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. I, uh, I thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference and giving me the opportunity to speak. So I'm uh, interested with the task of reviewing the recent developments in gauge gravity duality uh, in quantum matter. And this is a very hard task because of the all, you know, the wide range of applications that are ranging from condensed matter systems to quantum information theory, non-equilibrium QFT, particle physics, even astrophysics. And this richness is also witnessed by the fact that there are so many books and review papers written on the subject recently. So instead of trying to give an overview of all of these subjects, which is, which I'm not qualified for, I decided to um, tell you about five short stories that appeared uh, recently, in the last two years or so, uh, in this part of this uh, spectrum. I will mostly be talking about high TC superconductors, QCD, and quark gluon plasma. But first, let me set the stage. So, applied to quantum matter, gauge gravity duality is most useful uh, when we consider thermal state, because the thermal states are dual to black holes. And we know that the black hole horizons are of thermodynamic dissipative uh, and thermodynamic and dissipative nature. And most importantly for this talk, they also feature short-lived excitations, uh, like with normal modes. And uh, these are exactly of the same time scale, this Planckian time scale, as conjectured to be underlying the, uh, uh, these uh, strongly correlated materials like ITC superconductors, quark gluon plasma, um, ultra-cold Fermi gases, graphene, and so on. So the holography, well, pH gravity duality is most useful if you want to study in these systems transport, thermalization, quantum chaos, and questions like that. Now, these strongly correlated systems also often admit a description in terms of hydrodynamics, and that's because of a separation of scales that appears quite, quite generally. And uh, there are, on one hand, there are these facts relaxing modes, these Planckian time scale modes that I mentioned. But of course, in these systems, there are also conserved quantities like energy, momentum, angular momentum, charge, and so on. And uh, they cannot change their magnitude in a given space point, so they have to be transported to, to relax. And this takes time. If you wait long enough, your theory will be effectively described by a local theory of conserved charges. That's nothing else but hydrodynamics. And to summarize, well, this is a summary of hydrodynamics. You have this con conservation equation for uh, some charge densities, corresponding current. And the, the fact that you can apply uh, thermodynamics locally in these systems means that you can expand your current in terms of a derivative expansion uh, of the charge densities. And this derivative expansion comes with uh, some coefficients, transport coefficients. And indeed, one of the key roles that uh, gauge gravity duality has been playing was to compute these transport coefficients at strong coupling. And one such uh, transport coefficient, the shear viscosity, has always been a hallmark of applied holography. And as you can see in these uh, in these plots, uh, quark gluon plasma, ultra cold Fermi gases, uh, even graphene at charge neutral point, they come very close to uh, to the universal holographic answer. But the the main question, okay, so we have all these beautiful systems that show non Fermi liquid like behavior, short lived excitations, and so on, but we don't really have a, a string dual, a precise string dual to these uh, realistic systems. In the absence of a precise string dual, uh, the best you can do is uh, you can do is to apply two, two approaches. Either you can use proxies for these theories, by, by that I mean, for example, using N equals four spring angles for QCD, ABJM for non-fermi liquids in two plus one, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, you know, two-dimensional gravity for uh, for one-dimensional systems and so on. And, but then the obvious question, of course, is how good is your proxy? Um, I'll try to tell you, well, I'll try to convince you in this, in this talk that this is, uh, this is pretty good, actually. So I'll give you an update on the comparison between N equals 4 and QCD uh, at, uh, in, thermal, in thermal states in the second part of my talk. So. And, well, the second method you can use is to consider these bottom-up holographic models, which are based on a really extremely simplified description, holographic description of these systems based on Einstein's gravity coupled to matter, um, like charge and scalar fields and so on. And uh, let me just exemplify this in the case of QCD. <coughs> 
in QCD, uh, the, well, if you want to model these most important operators in the infrared, like energy momentum tensor, um, Gluon field strength, quark, uh, quark condensate, what you do is just you construct a theory in gravity coupled to matter in five dimensions, and then fix your theory, this gravitational theory, there are potentials in this theory, of course, by demanding some of the salient features of your quantum matter. In the, in the case of QCD, there are confinement, chiral symmetry breaking, gap spectrum, gap hadron spectrum, and so on. However, of course, that this is, this is not the right thing. Well, this is not the, it cannot be the right thing, the ultimate answer, because uh, it is in the right direction, but it's not uh, because QCD doesn't really have a consistent truncation of operators down to gravity. It has infinitely many operators, which, you know, some subsector of them do not really decouple, unlike in N equals 4 superior angles at infinite soft coupling. So what we really need is a full, full world sheet description. However, in the absence of this, you can still use these bottom-up models to arrive at a qualitative understanding of certain phenomena, or uh, most importantly for this talk, just to inspire ideas. And as long as you can reproduce these, these ideas, by uh, more traditional methods like hydrodynamics or toy quantum field theory models and so on. This is, a, I think this is an extremely useful um, um, path. So um, the, the rest of my talk, I will first focus on uh, high TC superconductors. Well, this is condensed matter side, this is the particle physics part. So, uh, and describe two recent proposals. So these are my five short stories. Uh, describe two recent proposals, one based on uh, for this uh, salient feature, linear in temperature resistivity, observed in these uh, materials. And um, one, one is based on hydrodynamics and the other is based on a SYK inspired microscopic model. These are not my works, I will be talking about other uh, authors' works. Uh, and then in the second part I will mostly, mostly focus on uh, you know, stuff that are related to my own work. And there is, uh, first I will just give a comparison between N equals 4 super Youngmans and QCD. And then I will tell you about some new form of uh, transport in, in quark clone plasma, spin hydrodynamics, and um, QCD in the presence of magnetic fields. So this is the plan. So let's start with the first part, high TC superconductors. And I will first tell you this, uh, this story about based on Soto Goldstone hydrodynamics. And this is a, a typical phase diagram of a high TC superconductor. I'm not going to explain all these di various different orders here. This is a complicated phase diagram. For us, the most important part will be, uh, well, there's a superconducting phase, of course, there is a charge density modulation phase where the charge density waves are present. And then there is this, uh, most importantly, there is this strange metallic phase which features these extremely short-lived excitations, these Planckian scale excitations. And um, it's, it's not in a normal metallic state, so it has all these anomalous features. Uh, one, and well, first of all, it's uh, believed to be governed by some fixed point hiding here under the dome. Um, and um, then you can, there are two, essentially, like many different salient features, but I would, let me highlight two of them. One of them is linear in temperature resistivity, and uh, this is unlike what you observe in the Fermi liquid phase, which would go like quadratically in temperature. And this is quite uh, it's an anomalous behavior, but it's very generic to these materials. Well, most recently uh, observed salient feature of these uh, of these materials of this phase is also this charge density fluctuations, which is going to play some role in the first uh, story I'm going to tell you, so let me just highlight it. So this is, uh, these are charge, charge density modulations in this part of the phase diagram, as you can see from, uh, you know, it can, you, it can be observed at different parts of the phase diagram, and it comes with a characteristic momentum scale which spontaneously breaks translation symmetry. So let's focus on them. I mean, we can reformulate the, the theory of these charge density modulations by essentially, in terms of, uh, and spontaneous symmetry breaking and of translation symmetry because there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking think of these uh, you know charge density waves these waves of course break the translation symmetry but there's a mode the goldstone mode that corresponds to sliding of these waves it comes with some sliding velocity this is the dispersion relation the most general dispersion relation you can write down for this goldstone mode it's uh, because it's gapless at finite temperature it can also diffuse however these metals are never clean so there's always some form of um, weak explicit translation symmetry as well, and that comes from disorder. Once you have disorder, you, you, a gap opens, and the dispersion relation becomes gapped, there's a gap, and at finite temperature, there's also a relaxation rate. So these are the most general dispersion relations that you can write down for this, uh, for this mode. So it becomes a pseudo goldstone mode. Now, um, in, a priori there is no obvious relationship between these two, phenomena, relaxation, and diffusion, but uh, a curious relation has been observed, uh, has been observed, 
um, in, in holographic studies in the last, uh, last, last years. So let me uh, focus on that. So you can model these, these systems in this bottom-up approach in a variety of different, different models, and many authors worked on it. Um, but let me just focus on this particular simple example. These are holographic Q-lattices based on three plus one-dimensional ADS gravity, coupled to a, a, a charge, well, some gauge field, and a number of scalars which can be put in this form, in this complex form. And um, you can choose this, uh, these phases to be linear in these space directions. And whenever you have a non-trivial amplitude, this would correspond to a spontaneous or explicit breaking of translation symmetry on the boundary. And depending on which coefficient you choose, either you have an explicit breaking or spontaneous breaking. And what these authors have studied was they considered this weak explicit breaking limit that corresponds to weak disorder, if you want, in these materials, uh, in some units of charge. And in this limit, you can compute these correlation functions of uh, pseudo Goldstone boson and the charge. And what you, from the Kubo formulas, you can compute these coefficients. And what you find is this curious relationship between the relaxation rate and the diffusion constant. And the proportional constant is just the mass square uh, of the pseudo Goldstone. Now, this was, this remained as some curious relation in holography until recently. This was also shown using a, a very um, basic property of hydrodynamics, uh, locality. So let me explain that. So this is, um, uh, this is the conservation equation of, of hydrodynamics. Um, and this is essentially what, what I did here is just I took a Fourier transform, went to the um, momentum space, and uh, I substituted also the constitutive relation that was, uh, you know, the, that was just expanding the, the current in terms of uh, derivatives of charge. So this becomes a, a polynomial in momentum if you just uh, truncate your derivative expansion at some finite order. So this is a local matrix. This is what it means that you know, this hydrodynamics is local. But if you want to study transport, you also have to add external sources to its corresponding to these charges, like deforming your Hamiltonian like this. And it's a one-page exercise to show that this equation in the presence of sources is modified into this form. This is Cardinal of Martin theory. And this third term is proportional to the susceptibility matrix. That is the second variation of the effective action with respect to uh, chemical potentials corresponding to these sources. And this term is, has also have to be local. And it is actually local in most of the cases in these hydrodynamic descriptions because it's local beyond the a correlation, thermal correlation length. And typically this thermal correlation length in these systems is, uh, is smaller in hydrodynamic systems, is smaller than the typical length scales that we consider for, for hydro. However, except there are, there are two exceptions. One is the presence of pseudo Goldstone modes, pseudo old Goldstone modes, or uh, if you are near criticality, because in both of these cases, the correlation length uh, becomes extremely large. So you have to demand this locality condition by hand. So let me just uh, give this as an example. First, in, in the case of a superfluid, you can write down the effective action in this form. So this is the, uh, the source corresponding to charge. This is the source corresponding to the Goldstone boson. This is the Goldstone boson itself, which is kept in the hydrodynamic description, essentially because it has very large correlation length. And you can also introduce weak explicit breaking by just turning on a mass term uh, in this free energy. And then, you know, the, the most general thing that you can write down is something like this. Uh, there are all couplings between the Goldstone boson and the, and the, and the charge as well, but I'm not going to show them. I'm not showing them here. But then it's a one-line exercise, of course, to show that uh, when you compute the susceptibility matrix by taking two variations with respect to this source, you get a propagator form by just completing the square, and this is quite non-local. So this happens, for example, this is an example uh, that is happening in the, in the case of pseudo Goldstone bosons. This is not necessarily um, uh, local. However, we have to remember that what we really need is the product of this matrix M and the susceptibility. And um, you know, the, in this matrix M can be obtained from a Josephson relation. Um, it, it goes like this. Here is your relaxation rate and the diffusion constant. If you put these two get together, uh, what you get is this ratio. And if you demand locality, you see this non-trivial relation between these two. Because in that case, this uh, becomes local. OK, so this was uh, very quick. Uh, as a derivation, but this can be also shown uh, using different, a variety of different methods. For example, uh, schwinger kaldish formalism of hydrodynamics and, and uh, other methods. I'm not going to mention those. Uh, but uh, for, for our, in our case, this has uh, very important implications when you apply uh, this relationship to high TC superconductors. And that is, that comes from uh, a theory of spontaneous and explicit, weak explicit breaking of translation symmetry to, to formulate these charge density fluctuations. 
Uh, you can go ahead and just use your Kubo formulas in this hydrodynamic theory to compute the uh, resistivity. And what you find essentially is quite generically you have two different contributions. One is coming from momentum relaxation, this constant term, and the other comes from the pseudo Goldstone relaxation. And that is really, I, I used already here this relationship between the um, relaxation rate and the diffusion constant. And then what we also know is that uh, we can derive in, you know, modulo certain assumptions some, um, some diffusivity bounds. So um, this has been reviewed in, in, in previous um, string conferences. I'm not going to explain how. But uh, um, so there are these, diffusivity, these diffusion constants obey some uh, Planckian bounds. They go like 1 over temperature. And if you just combine these two, uh, essentially you get this very generic uh, relation, which shows there is a constant term and there's a linear in temperature resistivity. So this is a nice suggestion that appeared uh, recently. Uh, of course, this is not the end of the story. There are many open issues. I will just uh, mention those at the end of my first part of my talk. Now, let me move on to a, 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 another description um, that also appeared last year, well, this year and last year. And that's based on some toy quantum field theory models. Um, so this is, again, based on the idea that uh, uh, this strange metallic phase is well described by quantum criticality. And um, you know, the strange metallic phase of this the anomalous linear and temperature resistivity can also be observed in other materials as well, which is also um, conjectured to be uh, governed by some quantum critical point. So it's a, I think it's in general a, a suggestive idea. It's, it's a good suggestion to, to consider to model these systems based on quantum criticality. And one, uh, this has been, of course, done for a very long time. A generic description in the case of a metal is uh, coupling a gapless scalar uh, which corresponds to order parameter fluctuations of your quantum critical point and uh, to Fermi surfaces. Um, but before explaining this SYK model, let me mention, which is you know, quite important for this talk, that all of these developments, these SYK inspired models, have been possible thanks to uh, applied holography in some sense. A second hallmark of, uh, of uh, gauge gravity duality has been applications to non Fermi liquids, and this is a canonical model, a charged ADS for black hole that is. That is just uh, in the infrared, which features this ADS2 factor, it's quantum criticality. And you can compute fermions, uh, fermion correlation functions in the system. And indeed, what you get uh, is this uh, extremely short, short lived excitations um, that appeared a long time ago. Uh, and um, so these are non Fermi liquids. And based on this, is essentially coming from uh, an interaction of a probe fermion with this ADS2 region. I mean, based on this idea, I think it inspired this revival of. Uh, SYK-like models, essentially because this, this behavior is very similar to fermion scattering of SYK, because this is an SYK here. So, um, and here is the model. It's a complicated uh, slide. This is the, my most complicated slide. So, um, the, so this model was developed, SYK, two plus one dimensional SYK-inspired model, uh, last year by such, such seven collaborators. And this is essentially, um, this is the Fermi surface, so you have N flavors of fermions, and uh, these fermions co are coupled to uh, an order parameter through this Yukawa coupling, and um, there are these non-trivial coefficients. I, these indices are varying from 1 to n. This is just like in SYK, and you can, you can introduce randomness in flavor. You can average over couplings, uh, random couplings, uh, you know, subject to these uh, averaging conditions. And then this defines for you in the this, in this system some systematic expansion in 1 over n, and also the di diagrammatic expansion in the coupling constant. So, however, if you just uh, compute uh, transport, you don't really get uh, optical, well, you don't really get linear interior resistivity because the real part of the optical conductivity that you obtain is, uh, it features this delta function, and this is really coming from momentum conservation, as we all know. So this is a Druda peak without relaxation, and this just uh, doesn't give you what you want. Um, you can break momentum translations by introducing this, uh, these couplings, fermion-fermion scattering term, so potential, fermion potential term, and you can still, you can introduce now um, randomness, not only in, in these flavor variables, but also, also in space. Uh, there is some correlation in, in space, which is quite important. So this is to model this order. Okay. And then, uh, then you indeed obtain a constant DC conductivity determined by this electron-electron scattering rate, this electron-electron scattering rate, uh, that goes proportional to V square. But uh, this is not what we want. And then it was what was realized last, uh, well, this year, was this, if you also do spatial randomness in this Yukawa coupling, add some spatial randomness in the Yukawa coupling, uh, like this, then, then you indeed get uh, linear and temperature resistivity. You get a generic form of conductivity of this form, and if you go to infrared, you get uh, linear T resistivity. Okay. So, I mean, to my knowledge, this is one of the very few models 
Uh, actually, it may be the only microscopic model that's really based on quantum criticality, and that leads to this linear in temperature resistivity in, this, in these systems. Okay, but let me give a discussion of this. Um, so this happened very recently, so as I said, it cannot be the end of the, the story, so this is a very, very important open question in condensed matter theory. Um, so first of all, these pseudo -Golston, I mean, either of, so pseudo -Golston hydrodynamics and SYK inspired models, of course, the obvious question is, do they really apply to, um, to realistic materials? In the case of pseudo -Golston hydrodynamics, you can always ask the question whether you have, uh, you can really formulate these charge density fluctuations uh, based on pseudo -Golston hydrodynamics. This is a big um, leap, of, uh, leap of faith. And, um, and then, it also relies, of course, as I showed in this derivation, it relied on this uh, diffusive is the bounds. It doesn't prove them, it just uses them. And, uh, and there's no notion of quantum criticality in that case. And in the other case, it's specific to large N. As I mentioned, there is a systematic expansion in, in N, but this, this was not shown. I mean, the transport was not studied at uh, uh, lower orders in, in 1 over N, and that's because, uh, well, higher orders in 1 over N, and that was because it's extremely hard. And on the other hand, there is no charge density waves or fluctuations, and uh, so on. So these are all open questions, but um, common to both is the Planckian dissipation, which was playing a very important role, both in this case and also in this case, because it's uh, quantum criticality that leads to Planckian dissipation. And both of them had this important feature of disorder. Without disorder, you don't get uh, linear in temperature resistivity in, in either case, and uh, well, and then long range correlations. In one case, it was coming from the pseudo Goldstone boson, and in this case, it comes from the in this case, it comes from quantum criticality. So, so maybe the, if there is a take home message um, uh, in from the first of part of my talk, I think this is this one. So this may be playing some important role um, to understand linear in temperature resistivity. Okay, so let me uh, move on to the second part of my talk, QCD, and. Um, so first I will give you an update of, on uh, the comparison between N equals 4 super young and QCD at finite temperature, of course. Uh, at zero temperature, there's no comparison. One of them is conformal, the other is confining. Um, so this the first indication that N equals 4 can be used as a good uh, proxy for, uh, for QCD is coming from these lattice simulations of pure, pure young mills. So this is uh, energy, entropy, and pressure density as a function of temperature, which features this... Uh, this uh, approximate conformality. Uh, so this is the first indication, and the second one is essentially this when you compute this plateau is about 80% of the free Stefan Boltzmann limit of pure Young's theory, which is very similar to what, uh, what has been observed using ADS-CFT by if you compute this ratio of entropies at infinite coupling uh, and, uh, and the free theory. It's uh, 75%. Okay, so this numerology, of course, doesn't indicate that N equals 4 Spriagmus is a good candidate, but at least there's this appro approximate conformality. Okay. Well, now I, what I want to do is, uh, first I would like to really uh, give an update on this comparison, and this update is going to be based on the quark lone plasma. I'm, uh, uh, I think not many people are familiar with the quark lone plasma physics, so let me just review this. Um, so this is based on, well, this quark lone plasma can be created in heavy ion collisions. This is a cartoon of heavy ion collision. So first you have these uh, strongly correlated, strongly interacting quarks and gluons produced in the first phase, and then they, they produce very quickly, extremely rapidly, they produce this non-fermi, well, sorry, non-equilibrium quark lone plasma phase. And then this, uh, it expands, it reaches equilibrium, uh, and it keeps expanding. As it expands, it cools down. When it reaches to this uh, QCD deconfinement temperature, which is about 160 MeV or so, it produces hadrons, then it keeps expanding. These hadrons are first strongly correlated. They lose their correlation at the freeze-out temperature about 130 MeV, and then they freely stream towards the detectors. And you know, you, from this distribution of these hadrons, you, you try to infer, uh, you, you infer the properties of transport properties of um, the quark lone plasma that existed in these two phases. And it turns out that it's perfectly described by hydrodynamics. And let me just uh, so show this. So these are hydrodynamic simulations that we've performed in Utrecht two years ago, together with um, well, Bilke van der Ske, uh, Raymond Snellings, who's an experimental physicist, and Howard Nice, my PhD student at the time. And what we found is, uh, so these are hundreds of different simulations, and this is a comparison with data. As you can see, they're working perfectly well. And these hundreds of different simulations have different values for the transport coefficients. So this is essentially giving you some Bayesian analysis of the transport coefficients based on data only. There is no holography, it's just uh, data and hydrodynamic simulations. And with this map, so this is some kind of observable, this is the uh, 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 
differential cross, differential cross, cross section. And um, so if you do this matching, what you find is the, the most probable values for the, court, for the transport properties, especially shear viscosity and bulk viscosity in quark room plasma, are very close to what you observe. Uh, what you what you know what you what you get in ADS CFT. So first of all, the shear viscosity is almost on top of the universal holographic value. This comes from this comparison, and the bulk viscosity. More importantly, the bulk viscosity turns out to be an order of magnitude smaller than the than the shear viscosity. So I think this is the strongest indication that at finite temperature n equals four is a, is a very good proxy for QCD. Um, so this is the most recent update I have, unless some paper appeared today. Um, so this is uh, this is the, the the third story I would like to I wanted to tell you, and but it also shows you that uh, these these hydrodynamic simulations are working quite fine, um, but these simulations are missing some important ingredients. Uh, in particular, the, there is some angular momentum in these experiments, so it produces. So if if you consider an off-central collision, there is the uh, the initial angular momentum of the beams that is translated into some angular momentum flow in the quark lone plasma. And also these are charged ions, so they, they have to produce a very large values of magnetic field. And they do. And uh, you know, these, these, uh, these important, uh, uh, you know, these, these facts should be, should be taken into account when you consider a flow of charge or spin in this, in this theory. And this is completely missing in the current um, description, hydrodynamic description of the quark lone plasma. Now, I will be talking about these two in the, in the rest of my talk. So, well, you can always argue that the magnetic fields die very quickly because they can, you know, the charges in the quark lone plasma, the quarks can redistribute themselves, uh, but, but the vortices remain. I mean, the vortices coming from this angular momentum flow uh, remain, and this should really uh, affect at least the spin dynamics. And this is, that's indeed uh, uh, what, what will be important in, the, in, in my fourth story, is to construct this relativistic spin hydrodynamics that is taken into account uh, this spin flow. Um, and this is not just an academic question, because uh, there was this recent observation in uh, three years ago, uh, which observed, uh, again, I'm not going to get into details of this, but this is a, a, a pol average polarization of, uh, of a, a hyperon particle, a particular kind of a hadron, which shows this spin polarization. So this is uh, essentially conjectured to be coming from uh, a spin orbit coupling in QCD. So essentially, this um, angular momentum in the quark lone plasma is uh, trans transferred to the spins of these, uh, of these observed hadrons. And here is the observation. So the main question is, of course, can we really understand this, this plot using either holography or hydrodynamic uh, description? OK. So um, before doing that, I have to address a very basic ambiguity in quantum field theory, if you want to consider quantum field theory with the spin current, this is, uh, there is an ambiguity. And this ambiguity is coming from the fact that you can always add improvement terms to your energy momentum tensor, and uh, these improvement terms shift the spin part of the total angular momentum like this, and you can always choose, for example, the bell infante rosenfeld gauge which, uh, to set this spin part to zero. And these this different gauges, they all conserve Conserve this, uh, conserve, they are preserve these conservation laws, the total energy momentum conservation and total angular momentum conservation. Okay, well, how do we, but in this case of, if you really want to compute this um, polarization of these particular hadrons, we really have to fix this ambiguity. We, we, we are really, want, we want to consider this part unambiguously. We have to address the spin part of the total angular momentum. And uh, one clue comes from um, considering the system in, 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 in holography. Um, so, for example, suppose that you want to add a spin flow on your boundary plasma. What you would do in holography is, of course, to consider uh, first the, the source that couples to spin operator. And that would be, in this case, in this particular case, that would be a spin connection. And then uh, gauge gravity duality would just extend this towards the bulk, make it dynamical, and then from the infalling boundary conditions or your, of your dynamical spin connection field, you can infer the one-point function of the uh, spin uh, flow. But of course, this doesn't happen usually, right? So because because this uh, spin connection is not an independent quantity, in in the in the normal uh, second uh, formulation of uh, second order formulation of gravity, we never have a non-trivial in independent uh, spin connection. It's just completely dependent on the field bind. Uh, but you can study this toy as a toy model in a toy model, and um, so based on some torsion full uh, theories of gravity in five dimensions, low lock John Simon's theory, and there. 
the way it works that you know you can you can obtain a one point function for the spin current is essentially because because the field line and the spin connection becomes independent in the presence of a torsion so this is a torsion full theory but this also re suggests a resolution um, in the for the hydrodynamic description and that is essentially i can also explain it in a, in a more clear way maybe no that is uh, so consider a quantum field theory in a non trivial lorentz representation where you have your effective action as a function of uh, this field bind and the spin connection and then you can obtain the one-point functions, energy, momentum, tensor, and spin current by taking variations with respect to these sources. And the, what you get, of course, is completely, the, you know, the spin current vanishes. Every, this automatically gives you Bellin van der Rosenthal gauge because what we normally take is uh, if that field, the spin connection is dependent on, on the field line uh, to, to satisfy this compatibility condition. But now you can also, of course, turn on torsion and keep your torsion as an external source and then you fix it because essentially torsion is the, has the same number of degrees of freedom as the Bellin Panther Rosenthal ambiguity. So the suggestion is to take your quantum field theory, put it on a curved manifold with torsion, and then just uh, keep your torsion as an external source, compute everything, and at the end you send torsion to zero to obtain unambiguously all these, uh, these um, one point functions or spin uh, chemical potentials, as I will show. Okay, so that's the suggestion. And this works. So this works. We can show um, that indeed um, you can construct this uh, hydrodynamics with, uh, in the presence of torsion. So once you have this idea, it, uh, so this was the inspiration that came from uh, holography. Once you have this idea, you can just go ahead and construct the hydrodynamic theory now. Uh, so it turns out for technical reasons, it's better to use contortion rather than torsion. So let me remind you that the contortion is the, uh, the independent part of the spin connection, independent of field line. And now you can just uh, consider the most general effective action, hydrodynamic effective action, and you can just uh, obtain, uh, by demanding the formorphism and lo local Lorentz invariance in your effective action, leads to this uh, hydrodynamic equation. So these are energy momentum conservation and the, the total uh, angular momentum conservation, if you want, in the presence of uh, torsion. I'm not going to give, give you details of these equations, but essentially for me, the important thing is that there, are, there exist these well-defined equations. These are exact. And uh, there are 10 equations. We need 10 variables, and one of them is temperature. The three of them are just uh, fluid velocity, as u, u squared is one, so in four dimensions this has three degrees of freedom, and the, the remaining six are given by the spin chemical potentials, just like in the charge uh, hydrodynamics, we have this uh, uh, electric chem chemical potential given by the, uh, the temporal component of the gauge field. Here this is given by the temporal component of the spin connection field. You can consider this as a gauge field, a non-abelian gauge field. So these are the spin chemical potentials. And the important thing is that once I can obtain these spin chem chemical potentials from this hydrodynamic theory, I can, I can go ahead and compute the, the spin polarization um, uh, of the cyprone particles based on some, uh, some kinetic theory relations, which are well known and uh, established uh, before. So for us, the important thing is to obtain this, these dynamical variables by solving these equations. But you can actually obtain these dynamical variables without solving these equations by considering the thermal uh, equilibrium. That is hydrostatics. So hydrodynamics is defined as a, as a derivative expansion near thermal equilibrium. And he, we, we are very familiar with this from, from atmospheric fluids, for example. In the case of an atmospheric fluid, you have uh, the gradient of the temperature is completely determined by the gravitational pull. pull. So this is the gravitational force, the acceleration, uh, which is given for a fluid like this. This is the acceleration. And in the case of a metal or, or, or some, some charged uh, no, fluid, you can, in the presence of an external electric field, the, the chemical potential is completely determined, the gradient of the chemical potential is completely determined in terms of the electric field like that. So this is demanding thermal equilibrium in the presence of time-independent external sources. This is hydrostatic equilibrium, and uh, it generally gives a relationship between the, your external sources uh, and your dynamical, uh, hydrodynamical variables. <coughs> So we, we can add a third item on this list, which is coming from uh, keeping torsion as an external force in your system. So this was derived last year, and uh, this is you know, surprisingly new. And so torsion uh, essentially re is related to these spin chemical potentials, acceleration and vorticity in your fluid in this combination. And so this is quite nice because even in, this, in the limit, at the end of our calculations, as I mentioned, we will send the, the torsion to zero. Even when you send torsion to zero, this just tells you how the spin chemical potentials are determined completely from the, the fluid data. It's first, first derivatives of the, of the fluid data, so this acceleration and vorticity. Okay.
Well, this was only for hydrostatics. Of course, it's a, it's a big leap of faith to believe that uh, you know, hydrostatic apply to quark lone plasma. But what you can show, quite non-trivially, I'm not going to show you the calculation, is that this relationship that comes from that uh, hydrostatic relationship is, uh, is essentially valid up to second order in derivatives in, in, in your hydrodynamic uh, expansion. So this, is, uh, this was a surprise to us, uh, but it tells you, and you know, in the hint side, it, it is a, it's a consistent with, uh, with the fact that we can always set the spin current to zero in, in the usual hydrodynamics, and it essentially tells you that the spin is really slave to the background flow. It is completely determined in terms of this fluid values to you. And now you can go ahead, once you have your spin chemical potentials, you can choose your hydrodynamic uh, description of your quark lone plasma. What we chose was uh, uh, you know, some simplified, extremely simplified version of uh, quark lone plasma based on a conformal boost and parity invariant flow called the Bjorken flow. Uh, but this is often applied to uh, QGP. And then what you get is indeed, so from this you can obtain the spin chemical potentials using this relation. And you get some 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 results, but I don't know what to say about this result. It's suggestive. It's uh, it's it's at least in the same ballpark. So this is a proof of principle, um, uh, showing that hydrodynamics with spin is uh, is working fine. Okay, now um, let me move on to the last story I wanted to tell you today, and this is this is about the the second missing ingredient uh, I told you. So there's the quant this is the magnetic fields. In this, um, there are many different ways to motivate studying magnetic fields with, uh, in, well, QCD in the presence of magnetic fields, and that's essentially it's a very basic thing to do. Um, but also there are, uh, there are different motivations. For example, in the quark lone plasma, I mentioned already that uh, very large values of magnetic fields are present. And you can show that these magnetic fields decay, um, but uh, decay very fast because this is a logarithmic plot, but, um, but still in the important part, of, this, uh, of, the, of the expansion of the fluid, they are uh, at the same order as the uh, uh, mass scale of uh, QCD, which I'm taking here as the pion mass, 135 mV. And so this, this indicates that you know, these magnetic fields should have some um, substantial uh, effect on the charge spin and chiral dynamics. And indeed, it has been conjectured by Karzir and others that uh, this chiral magnetic effect that is coming from magnetic fields in the presence of chiral anomalies may be playing a very uh, key role in understanding some of the long-standing puzzles of particle physics like matter antimatter asymmetry. I'm not going to say much about this, but this is one of the basic motivations. And another thing comes from um, <clears throat> studying the cores of the neutron stars. Um, because there you need to you need a, a, a theory of QCD in the presence of magnetic fields, and I'm not going to talk about neutron stars either. But there has been some important development in the last uh, last year or so, and uh, this was reviewed by in this review paper, the hol applying holographic QCD to, to neutron stars. And there was a very nice paper by Hong Liu and Sasha Grasdano, uh, Shreya Vardhan. Uh, uh, and uh, another student of, uh, uh, of Hong uh, that appeared very recently, I forgot to put here, so that's, that was uh, doing neutron stars in the, from a hydrodynamic approach, so that's I think also quite interesting. Um, but for me, the main motivation is really coming from this phase diagram. So essentially you have, you have a temperature density axis, this is the more or less understood phase diagram of uh, QCD. I shouldn't say understood, there are all these kind of different question marks everywhere. I'm not going to talk about that. But essentially what we are doing here by turning on a magnetic field is really just adding a new axis. And it's a big question what happens here, everywhere in the phase diagram. And well, it, this is a fundamental question. And we know exactly what happens in this part of the phase diagram. Because at, at vanishing density or very small density, we can study this using lattice. And I'll tell you the answer first. So this is what happens. If you consider lattice simulations in the presence of magnetic field, the basic quantity that you would like to look at is a chiral condensate, because chiral condensate is characterizing the ground state of QCD. And what you want to know in this uh, part of the phase diagram is, uh, you know, how does your chiral condensate depend on temperature and magnetic field? And this is the answer. So what happens is that at vanishing temperature, it, uh, it, 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 goes mon it increases monotonously. Um, uh, and then if you crank up the temperature at a temperature about um, uh, about like a, a deconfinement phase transition, what you, what you see is that this, uh, there's a turnout, turnaround, and it 
uh, above a critical value of the magnetic field, it starts decreasing. So this is this. It starts magnetic field here acts constructively on the condensate. Here it tries to destroy it. And one of so, and you can also see it from this phase, this uh, this plot of the uh, cross the uh, chiral symmetry restoration temperature for these different uh, quarks as a function of uh, magnetic field. They just decrease immediately, like in here. Okay. So this is acting destructively again above these temperatures. So this is something that uh, under we understand. This, uh, the, the, this increase is something that we can easily understand. It's called magnetic catalysis. It's based on some simple physics. So in the presence of a magnetic field, essentially these spins of these quarks are aligned. Uh, and um, it, these are chiral quarks, which means that their motion uh, are restricted along uh, with the magnetic field. And it becomes, it effectively reduces the theory uh, from three plus one dimensions to one plus one dimensions, and we know that in one plus one, the correlation between uh, different chiralities is much stronger than in three plus one. So this strengthens the chiral condensate. So this is something that uh, we understand. But this other effect, inverse magnetic catalysis, is an open problem, and it's, it's an important open problem. It's, some, it's telling you that you know we don't really understand QCD in the presence of magnetic fields. Um, so one thing. Uh, so that's the. That's what I will be focusing on in the rest of my talk. And one obvious, uh, one really quite interesting thing is that this inverse magnetic catalysis, this effect that uh, magnetic fields can act destructively on the condensate, has first been observed in, uh, in holography, in, uh, in applied, so in a top down model of uh, QCD based on Witten Sakai Sigumoto model. And this was first done, I think, in, in here in Vienna. This is a paper of Anton and collaborators. And actually, they uh, invented this term, I think, as far as I know, this inverse magnetic catalysis. So this is a very nice example of how applied holography can influence um, the different fields in particle physics. So that, that's, I think, a, a very nice example. Um, however, it doesn't really uh, work. Well, it doesn't study in detail at uh, finite temperature. So to see these plots, you, you, you need um, you know, some different kind of uh, models. And there has been. Um, after Anton's uh, and collaborators' work, there were many, many developments in, in this, uh, developing these, these theories uh, for uh, inverse uh, magnetic catalysis. And I will be just focusing on one particular holographic model of QCD. That is, uh, that is um, uh, QCD, uh, holographic QCD in the Veneziano limit. Uh, Veneziano limit is the limit where you take the number of flavors, number of quarks in this case, to infinity along with the number of colors, keeping the ratio fixed. And because, uh, because essentially you want to do this to, to make sure that the effects of the, the magnetic field on the chiral condensate are not washed out by, by the large end limit. You want to keep flavor physics and the glue physics at the same order. And this can be done in these bottom-up models. So I'm not going to get into details of these models because for me it will be only important to inspire some ideas. And so this is, for example, a five-dimensional uh, Dilaton uh, model, Dilaton coupled to Einstein uh, gravity. Uh, so Dilaton is here playing the role of, uh, so it's dual to a, a gluon field strength. And um, then you can add flavors by adding you know, space-filling um, uh, brains in this, in, this, uh, in this theory, in this five dimensions. So there's space, space filling, there are D4 brains, uh, and there's, uh, there's one for the left-handers and one for the right-handers. And um, you can look at the excitations of the open string between them. And one of these uh, excitations, the tachyon, is a complex scalar, which, which is dual to this quark, quark condensate. And then you can also add magnetic field um, uh, in, a, in a toy model. This is a toy model by turning on a, uh, a diagonal U1 on these, on these brains. So the nice thing about this is that uh, it exactly like in this, it is in this bottom-up um, category. So they, it's, it's, you, know, you can choose your potential such that it's, it's, it corresponds to confining chiral symmetry breaking and gapped hadron spectrum. So it satisfies some of the salient features of QCD. And um, well, then you just you can consider you can uh, compute the uh, the condensate by solving the tachyon equation. I'm not going to give you the details. It's schematically it's given by this this equation. And these coefficients here are dependent on magnetic field and the your background uh, functions. Uh, and then this is what you get. So essentially you get um, at zero temperature, you get uh, magnetic catalysis. At uh, the confinement tem temperature, you get inverse magnetic catalysis, something in between. And you can also see this here, that uh, both the confinement temperature and the chiral restoration temperature goes down as a function of magnetic field, which is exact, well, very similar to what, uh, what has been observed in these uh, lattice models. But as I said, I'm not going to tell you that you know, this simplified, oversimplified model of QCD is going to reproduce the lattice data. It just gives you 
uh, well, it, it's at least in this right direction. But uh, for me, the most important thing is to use these this kind of models to understand the lattice state and not to reproduce it. So that uh, one clue essentially um, comes from uh, studying this equation more, more carefully. How much time do I have? Sorry? Four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes, perfect. And um, so if you look at this equation, you can identify, if you study it carefully, what you find is that there are two distinct types of uh, dependencies on the magnetic field. One of them is an explicit dependence, and the other is a dependence on the magnetic field that comes through this implicit dependence that comes through this, uh, these background functions. Why am I highlighting them? Essentially because you can isolate these different kind of dependencies by tuning uh, your, your control parameter, your this ratio of flavors to quarks. This is a toy model. You can tune this parameter, unlike on the lattice, of course. On the lattice, you cannot just, you know, it takes uh, two years to, to simulate a lattice, uh, lattice QCD calculation with a different number of flavors, so that's impossible. But here, you can just tune it freely, and you can isolate these dependencies. And if you do this, you can find that the explicit dependence really leads to catalysis, and the implicit dependence leads to the inverse effect. Um, uh, he, this, this is essentially, I think it can explain, uh, uh, with some leap of faith, it can explain this uh, competition between this increase and decrease. So there, there should be some competition, and this competition in these models are coming from, uh, from this. And this maybe can be understood using a more mundane approach, just uh, writing down the field, the path integral uh, expression for your quark condensate, uh, after you integrate out uh, the fermions, you have essentially two terms. One is coming from just this propagator between the quarks, and the other is coming from the fermion determinant. And, um, well, this has been conjectured, this can be shown by using the, the banks cashier relation of, uh, that was established in the 80s, uh, is to increase, so this role here, it, it, in the, the dependence on the magnetic field will be really leading to uh, catalysis, but, uh, but this is this is not known, and the conjecture is that uh, it, it will also it will lead to inverse catalysis. So these are parallel. Uh, but of course, in this field theory arguments, you can never identify this part and that part uh, in a gauge independent way. They are gauge dependent. They are not gauge invariant. Uh, so here, uh, well, holography is of course always gauge invariant on the boundary. So it would uh, this may be an uh, an analog, uh, a gauge invariant analog of this uh, this effect. Okay, so. Um, I, um, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, I, I told you, in the, so this is a summary of uh, the second part of my talk. First, I told you about uh, um, N equals 4 super young mills versus QCD, uh, this comparison. <clears throat> and I told you that this works almost perfectly well as a proxy. So now we can go ahead and try to understand uh, you know, rapid thermalization. That's one of the key uh, questions that, are, that, is, uh, that is still open. And, uh, well, I don't have a precise answer to this, but uh, what uh, N equals 4 super young mills at infinite coupling is trying to tell us that uh, this is happening due to this, again, due to these Planckian time scales in the problem, like in the non-fermi liquids. Uh, this has been studied in many papers. I'm not, this is not a full list, of course. But I think what I, the point I would like to make here is that I think now that we understand this, uh, I think it's time to incorporate magnetic fields and chiral imbalance and try to study uh, these important open questions like dynamical generation of the chiral magnetic effect, whether it is really there or not. The main, uh, the main um, uh, problem to study those directly in field theory is, of course, strong coupling. So here we can try to use N equals 4. These are open. Um, then I told you about uh, a new form of um, spin transport in, in quark lone plasma that was based on an observation, and then we just... Uh, constructed a holographic, uh, sorry, holographic and hydrodynamic model for it. And torsion was playing an important role. So essentially, it was playing, it was a, playing a bookkeeping role for, for the quark lone plasma. We were sending it in the, to zero in the end of the computations. But there are certain condensed matter systems, like uh, dislocations in graphene and, and other uh, uh, materials with atomic structure, which can also be modeled by, by torsion. Uh, in the, as an effective, uh, in the effective, uh, as an effective field theory of this dislocation. So this, they, they involve torsion. So then this, this qu obvious question is, can we use this kind of uh, torsion hydrodynamics to, um, um, well, to come up with uh, some new ideas, to new, new means of spin transport that may be very important for spintronics, for example. And finally, um, so this, uh, the spin transport comes with uh, lots of uh, uh, 
co coefficients, the spin transport coefficients. I didn't tell, show you this uh, constitutive relations for the spin current, but there are many. And the one obvious question is, can we use holography to compute them, just like in shear viscosity? So this is open. Um, so uh, this is the, the last slide I'm going to show. I, um, I, you know, unfortunately, I couldn't cover all the subjects. Of course, there have been very interesting developments in the last years or so uh, on you know, fractons, neutron stars, holographic thermalization, chiral anomalous transport, graphene, direct wild semimetals, and so on. So it's, it's such a big subject. But I think in most of these cases, we have, uh, uh, I can say safely, that uh, the gauge gravity duality applied to quantum matter is continuing to, 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 to be a great source of inspiration for us. Thank you. Hey, thanks for this great overview talk on the nice uh, short stories. I'm for questions. No? Hi, Umut. Thanks Hi, for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a somewhat specialized question about the first part about the pseudo Goldstone hydrodynamics. So I cannot hear very well for some reason. Let me try again. Can you take off the mask, maybe? It... Well, okay. Well, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, thanks again for the very nice talk. I have a rather specialized question about uh, the first part, the uh, pseudo goals on hydrodynamics. Okay. Um, so that, I guess, applies to superfluids because a global symmetry is spontaneously broken. <coughs> um, how far can you apply this to superconductors where you have a spontaneous breaking of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's great. So, like, I showed you the superfluid as an example. That was a, that was a, uh, just to set the stage, essentially, to tell you how this works. This locality in hydrodynamics leads to this relationship between these different transport coefficients. But actually, in this paper, when they where they computed the uh, the linearity resistivity, where they showed that this, it goes linear, they applied it to translation symmetry breaking. So the question is open. I mean, you can. So there, the the idea is to to, to consider the, um, the phase diagram outside this um, superconducting dome. And you have this, in particular, you have this strange metallic phase. And then the, the, the I, so where you, you believe that you know, hydrodynamics apply. And there, it's the, these charge density fluctuations lead to spontaneous and weak explicit breaking of uh, translation symmetry. So they are using, for example, in these papers, Wigner crystals and, and, uh, and um, you know, systems like that, so which spontaneously break charge density waves, Wigner crystals in one or two dimensions. Um, so this is based. This is pseudo hydrodynamics of translation breaking. But of course, the, the question is: in most of the realistic materials that I know, I mean, I don't know the answer to this question. But uh, this it depends on the correlation length. So if the thermal correlation length is uh, too small, then you know you wouldn't end up with this relationship. So there is uh, it's, it becomes an experimental question, and I I, uh, uh, I believe that most in most of the materials it, it doesn't really. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the correlation length is too small, but, but I don't know the answer. So there may be some extension of this, uh, these theories there. Yeah. In the discussion of magnetic catalysis, how are you defining the chiral condensate in the, let's say, holographic duals? In the holographic duals, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, so uh, there's no, um, Clear way of defining it in this uh, in the top top down models based on Witten Sakai Sugimoto model, but in this uh, this is a this is a simplified like mock model for QCD and there what you what you do is you add so I want to understand I want to consider this as some kind of a non critical string theory in five dimensions, so if I uh, if I'm allowed to do that of course there are all these alpha prime corrections which you cannot really control this is an uncontrolled approximation, if you can if you can do that then I can add these. Uh, flavor brains, and essentially the modeling of the quark condensate is based on this uh, uh, complex scalar fields, the open string tachyon fields on these, uh, on these fluctuations. Uh, yeah, and that is because this, this trans transforms as a, uh, as a bifundamental. Uh, hi, Umut. Um, so you had this polarization plot um, for the quark gluon plasma. No, no, the, the one before, yeah, this one. Uh, can you say something about these two outliers? Are they just statistical fluctuations, or is there some physical meaning behind them? <coughs> these these uh, two points, yeah. 
You mean like these error, error the, bars? It, no, yeah, so they are, they are lying quite a bit above the other one. They are, they are quite big because you cannot really, yeah, there are all kind of uh, you know, issues that leads to error. And uh, this, is, this is experimental plot. So this is yes. here, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's both, yeah, it's, I think there are both systematic and statistical errors that are, that are coming into this. So if you just look at this plot, um, this experimental plot, here, uh, so this is what, so mostly coming from statistical fluctuations indeed. But, um, but then, uh, well, one confusion that may arise is that here, here there are two different uh, <laughs> curves. I'm showing you only one curve at the end, and that was just the average of these two because this, this distinction is coming from the magnetic field. So in this case, you have hyperons and uh, hi lambda bars, mm -hmm. uh, and the hyperons, and those, uh, those, are, uh, those give you different results because of the magnetic field in our, in our you know, effective uh, hydrodynamic description, we didn't turn on magnetic field, so we were like, try trying to reproduce the average. Yes. Okay, thanks. More questions? Yeah, if not, then let's thank our speaker again for this wonderful Thank you very much. <laughs>